Is your wallet as empty as mine? If so, good news. This is the episode for you. Howdy. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Let's Talk Housing. Just a friendly reminder, my name is Brennan Thomas, and I am the co-host here alongside Stephen Thomas, the chief economist and founder of Reports on Housing. Today, our discussion will encompass the latest updates in the housing market, including key numbers and news. We'll also delve into the ongoing affordability challenges, the impact of rising interest rates, and the concerns over homeowners insurance. Just to start, I forgot to mention last time, but I wanted to say a quick thank you to everyone tuning in, to all of you amazing listeners. We're only six episodes in, but we're ranked in the top 50 for Apple Business News Podcasts. So that's just unbelievable. This just started as an idea back in college of me wanting people to hear the information that Steve was constantly telling me on the phone back and forth on these phone calls. It was just too informational, but just thank you. We truly appreciate it. That's outstanding. Yes. Thank you very much for tuning in. This is a lot of fun to do. Yeah. So Stephen, what's happening in the Thomas household? Well, uh, today our uh, sophomore she runs cross country and they had the league prelims and she came in first for varsity girls. So it was pretty outstanding. She led from the very moment that the gun went off and all the way to the finish line. Uh, it was absolutely outstanding. I'm surprised I have a voice because I was uh, screaming like crazy. It was a lot of fun. That's awesome. Super proud of her. So I need to ask you, of course, you're all that is a professional soccer, know a lot more than any other Thomas and pretty much anybody else that I, uh, I personally know. So I want to know what's going on in the soccer world right now. Well, it's, right now it's regular season. Everything's starting to pick up again. We have the Champions League, so the big European competition. It resumed a couple weeks ago, and now uh, we got regular season underway, and we're a couple games in, and it's... Everything starting to every single team starting to show their true colors where where they want to be in the standings and uh, it's it's insane it's always there's always something going on it's it's this the craziest sport alive in my opinion yeah how about but, your your team Arsenal how how are they <laughs> oh, so well we were doing good we tied last weekend to our rivals which was a bit of a heartbreak for me but uh, we won a couple of days ago in just a a side cup called the Carabao Cup. Um, it was awesome to watch. I was tuning into that, but, um, it's looking good so far, still undefeated, which no complaints there. So I, I will take that, but I just want to see them keep winning. That's all that matters for me. It's, it's everything. It's absolutely everything. And it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Yeah. So Steven, what's happening in today's market with uh, supply and demand? Well, uh, supply and demand, uh, pretty much almost across the board in all markets with the exception of just a couple uh we have we have the supply continuing to go up a little bit higher it's not like anything is screaming higher it's going up uh, just a bit we're looking at week over week over week uh it's going up slightly as well as demand has come down a bit uh, and demand is coming down a little bit faster than uh, as supply is going up. So as a result, we're, we've got this expected market time. That is, if you place your home on the market, when are you opening up escrow? It's our barometer of the speed of the market. It's, uh, it's growing across all markets. And uh, until we get inventory to peak and start to come down, uh, we're going to continue to see this where the market will continue to slow and feel a little bit more sluggish on a week to week basis while inventory continues to build and demand continues to slowly diminish. When you have the two working and in, in going in opposite directions, that's not what you want to see if you're a homeowner or a seller, but it is what you want to see if you're a buyer. It means that the overall market's slowing down, which means that it's uh, with this high rate environment, it's starting to lean more towards uh, buyers. Now, we just had a Fed meeting about a week ago, um, which will be two weeks when this is uploaded. But can you summarize what happened? Yeah, there really was nothing more, uh, much that was said. Uh, what what when you look at all, all of the uh, when you look at the speech and you, you listen to the Q&A, there's not really a whole heck of a lot of anything that's new. 
the the big difference is every quarter they come out with their their fed dots it's called their dot plot and it tells us it choreographs where they think interest rates are going to go in the future and uh, as far as where they think that interest rates are going to go for 2024, it was supposed to come down a little bit more and, uh, than uh, what was just released. So they did one in June. They did another one uh, in September. And going from June to September, all of a sudden, there are uh, rates are not going to come down as far as they had originally anticipated just in these last three months. But I do want to say that the Fed's not very good at forecasting out. So we'll talk about that. Yeah, I was just going to ask you, how accurate is the Federal Reserve at forecasting the future? Uh, not, not, not that accurate. Here, here's a couple of really good examples. In October of 2007, if you remember back then, October of 2007, I knew that we had a real issue. I've know, I knew it since the fall of 2005. And what they were saying, they projected the GDP in 2008 to be plus 2% for 2008. And what actually happened was it went down 3.8%. That was the beginning of the Great Recession. So as far as seeing what was going to happen, they didn't see it at, at all. I knew that ho housing was going to cave because we had reached 4 million homes across the United States, which was absolutely ridiculous. It was overabundance and, uh, of, of properties that were available, a glut of homes. And when you have too much of something, you're going to see uh, values just uh, just fall, crash, and that is exactly what we saw. So that's one example. I have another example, and that was in September of 2021. This, this is recently. They projected one hike in 2022. So in... It, Think about that. September, of tw September. that's not that many months away from 2022. They projected just one hike of a quarter percent. Instead, there were seven hikes for a total of going from zero all the way up to four and a half percent. And they were going at such a, not a quarter percent, they were, they were going at a quarter percent maybe the first month. They started doing three quarter percents uh, over and over and over again. And that's how they got to four and a half in such a short period of time. So as far as projecting where they're going to go, they're not very good at it. So for all those people that are that, that are giving them such weight, they, these these dot plots and saying where they think everything's going to go, just like everybody else out there, they really don't have much of an idea. And I don't think that they're looking at all of the pieces. I don't think that that uh, they they they've got it down. They are very very backward thinking. So I'm curious, I know we touched on this topic a little bit last episode, but is it safe to say that people are neglecting the impact of the slowdown on real estate and the industries connected to it? It seems as if everyone is uh, sort of fixated on um, unemployment or inflation. Yeah, so overall, their key objective is to watch that CPI come down. And a matter of fact, we got a another great inflation read today that came in way better than what everybody anticipated. So when you get these inflation reads that, that show that pathway that we're going to be continuing to go down, which is what has happened, it continues to happen, and it's it's... Uh, we're going to we're going to see this this uh, path, the trend of it going down is absolutely there. There are some economists that are worried about the impacts of fuel and then later on how it's going to uh, monkey with the numbers. But I'm not as concerned because I, there are a lot of headwinds right now that are going to override that, as well as we know that these giant lags in the uh, different inflation reads are all going to come down. So we're going to continue to watch this come down. So I think that they're focusing their focus on inflation is smart, but it doesn't mean that they've got to react to every single uh, time that there's a couple of uh, there's there's good news in the economy when they're getting what they want. So as far as employment's concerned, they're going to get that too, because there are a lot of headwinds like I've talked about and actually talk about in, in a forecast that we just released this week that we're going office to office uh, and uh, talking about. It really, uh, we're, we're, we're going to see some headwinds materialize into some readings down the road that are going to be where we see some slowing. And we're going to see that in the jobs numbers and all that stuff. So as soon as we see that type of thing, we're going to see that uh, in 
in in uh, re results in rates starting to come down, which will finally help out in the overall real estate market. It's hard for them to focus on the real estate side of things, and what and there are so many people that are making less that they're undercounted because they can be doing you know only one or two transactions per year, but they're counted as fully employed, and yet they're totally hurting. And there's a lot of people that are connected to sales that are that are dealing with that exact scenario. So it's just a matter of time before we start to see it in in other numbers and uh and it, so everybody just stay tuned um i do not say this with delight but mortgage rates hit a multi-decade high um percentage and what are your thoughts on this well uh good news is uh yeah i i this is the overreaction of of those dots that i talked about so they think that the fed is is higher for longer. So that's what the Fed's been talking about, that they're not going to pivot, that it's going to be higher for longer. And they're they're happy to hear that everybody's adopting their higher for longer. And that's the stance that they've had for quite some time. Uh, so higher for longer, yeah, it, it sounds, sounds fantastic. But once again, how good are they at forecasting where they need to be in the future? Not very good. I just demonstrated how they're not. So what happened was that earlier this year, nobody was really buying this higher for longer. And they were looking at the, the plot dot uh, and seeing going out that we were going to get relaxed rates down the road. But every single time these, these dots come out, so they come out in December, they come out every three months. So every single time they were dialing up how much higher interest rates are going to be for longer. And that's where we adopted this higher for longer. And they said, yeah, well, everybody's just coming to where we are right now. They've been changing their dots every quarter. So they've been moving the goalposts constantly. And now at this point, uh, everybody's reacting to, man, the overall economy has been hotter than what we expected. So we believe them it's going to be higher for longer. And as a, as a result, when this last dot plot came out, they everybody overreacted. And that's where you started to see this sh shoot up in the in long-term uh, bonds, as well as mortgage rates uh, started to go up. And, but you know what? It, it just takes some, some uh, more data. And like I said, down the road, we're gonna see more headwinds. We're gonna see more in the data. So we're starting to see that in, in today's inflation read, which came in today, it was way less than what they had anticipated. And if you strip out some volatility, it actually, there's a number of things you could do where you can see they're kind of getting towards their 2% uh, their, their, uh, target when you look at the last few months. And this is where they want to be. And it's going in that right direction. They understand it. They know it. So uh, the chances of a quarter rate point uh, uh, hike later on this year is starting to diminish. And uh, so this higher for longer has been adopted. So we have those higher rates. But then today, what happened? Interest rates dove off of just one, one piece of news. They dove. They started to go up a little bit more because there was hope for uh, the, this, this uh, impasse in, in Washington, D.C. to end. And, uh, but we're going to get into that in a minute because now it looks like we might be getting that government shutdown. So as a result, what happened to the 10-year? So it came down on that news. And then they, there was, uh, there, the Congress got together in the House and they, they failed to pass, uh, pass a bill that would avert this this uh this lockdown and as a result we're have or the shutdown and as a result what what do we have we have interest rates that are starting to go up on that news and so once that's resolved also we'll have interest rates come down as well so and would you say that interest rates can be very reactive to what's going on in the economy <laughs> oh my gosh overreacted overreacting <laughs> let's just say that like on a day-to-day -day basis, traders are saying, oh, this happened. Let's go. Woohoo. And then, oh, no, that wasn't very good. And let's, let's, let's dump it all. It's just, it's, it's, uh, I'm, I'm, I've always been one to, that looks far out. And my, my gauge for looking far out is probably a little bit uh, better than reacting to every single piece of news. Because when you get in that, that uh, mentality, especially right now, you, you, you tend to over-exaggerate things and you, 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 your fear factor uh, uh, starts to uh, take advantage of you. And that's what's happening. I, I think I mentioned it to you. I think uh, it's, it's something like 9% or uh, I think it's right around there of everything you worry about comes to fruition, which means that pretty much everything that you worry about doesn't really happen. So that's kind of what's happening right now, this overreaction to uh, daily numbers. But 
par for the course. We know what the trend is long term and we know where things will go. Now, I know you talk about the 10 year bond and then the 30 year fixed mortgage rate. Um, what does that spread between the two mean? Yeah, so going this this goes all the way back to 1971. So for a long time, and and uh, it, there's like th this love affair you can you can say between the 10 year Treasury and where mortgage rates are. So 10 year Treasury, the appetite of the investor for 10 year Treasuries is the same appetite typically of the investor for 30 year mortgages, mortgage backed securities, and. As a result, when you look at it, they kind of they jive together. So when the 10 year goes up, what happens to interest rates? They go up. When 10 year goes down, what happens to interest rates? They go down. So you can watch the 10 year and gauge where interest rates are going to go on a daily basis, yeah, which is what we do. A lot of lenders do. And a lot of people I talk to, I say, hey, you should get on this bandwagon. You should do it too. So uh, the normal spread is if you look all the way back to 1971 is 1.71. So whatever the 10 year is, you can add 1.71 and you get your mortgage rate. Well, uh, right now it's at 2.76, which actually it's that's way higher, but it was even higher. It was above three uh, recently. So it's actually come down. And this 2.76 that we just hit, uh, we do this every Thursday because uh, we, we peg it to uh, Freddie Mac's uh, uh, mortgage market survey, which goes back to 1971. So it makes it nice and easy. So we're looking at the same thing over time. But uh, if you look at the, the spread, it actually uh, went, it came down to 2.76, which, which is the lowest spread since March of this year. It's not like it's like outstanding. We need this thing to all get down to all the way to 1.71. So, which means that interest rates today are 1% higher than they typically are and has everything to do with the volatility and the uncertainty of the market. Uh, there are servicers that are involved that purchase uh, the ability to service loans. Typically, those loans have to be held for two years for them to make a profit. They're worried that people will refinance. So as a result, they're charging more. So as a result, lenders have to charge more. So interest rates are a lot higher because they think everybody's going to refinance sooner than two years. So they want to make more on a monthly basis. So that is why we have this giant spread. This will squeeze back down towards 1.71 when we have more certainty. When inflation comes down and we know that the uh, overall economy is, is uh, no longer speeding out of control, kind of like it's been, even though we've, we've jacked up the short-term rate from zero all the way up to 5.5% where it stands today. Now, with rates rising so much, especially to a record that we haven't seen in quite a while, what does that mean for affordability? Yeah, it's been quite some time. The last time we had rates this high was the year 2000. That's when the movie Gladiators came out for all those people that are uh, love their films. That was a long time ago. So, uh, yeah, it, it really does bite into affordability. Uh, it, you can see it across all the numbers. I have an affordability thing that I do for various markets and I plug in because affordability factors in a few different things. Factors in rates, it factors in where values are today, and then it factors in what incomes are. You got to look at all that mix because a lot of people say, well, interest rates have been even higher than they are today. Let me tell you that right now with interest rates at where they are right now, I've never seen them more unaffordable than where they currently are right now. Uh, maybe when they hit 20% for a minute, they, they were at like 18, 20% back in 1981 for a short period of time, kind of like what we realized uh, at, when they shot up to sub over 7.6%. But like I said, they already dipped below 7.5% today, so they've already come down considerably. So if you're stuck in that one day, you just can't really lock. A lot of people couldn't. So what we're seeing with this volatility and interest rates going up is it affects demand. Yeah, there's, there's still a lot of cash buyers that are out there. There are still people that have dual incomes that are still doing it, that they don't really worry that much about it. But the, the pie of potential uh, buyers, it shrinks considerably as rates go even higher. And that's exactly what's happening uh, right now. But we have a little bit of relief, but we really need interest rates to get below 7% to see uh, a, a, a giant amount of relief. So as rates and values rise, what do you advise to sellers and people in the market? Yeah, as far as sellers are concerned, they need to understand that with rates above 7%, which they've been stuck here for a while now, 
since the uh, end of July. This is a long time to be stuck above 7%. And now that they've stuck above 7%, we're really starting to see it uh, in, in the various numbers and the various markets. So we've seen a slowdown, this gradual slowdown. And so if you're a seller in this market, you need to understand that the buyers that are left, they are not going to, to want to... Uh, put a lot extra in, into a home. So if they're looking at a home and there's a decent amount of activity, your chances of going uh, above the asking price are starting to really diminish. And for those people with expectations that you're gonna get like what your neighbor did a few months back where they got an extra $30,000 above asking price, they're diminishing greatly. And you better have a really wow property where you've got a lot of offers that are generated in a marketplace where there's very, very little, little at all available. That's what you've got to look at. Now, that's uh, for, the, for the lion's share of everybody that's out there, that's not what's happening. So you really need to uh, you know, check yourself. You need to actually take a look and say, hey, you know what? This might take a little bit longer to sell. I need to be more realistic. I need to be right on price. Absolutely, the most important thing is you've got to price these according to fair market value. And you got to pack your patience. It's not going to happen instantly. It's going to take an extra couple of weeks in this kind of a market. And there are some markets where we already know that values are coming down because they are, their market times have grown. Uh, we've seen it in the more uh, inland you get, I've seen them in those kind of markets. So like the Inland Empire, they were first. They're actually seeing values accumulatively starting to go down. So you got to watch it, and that's coming to all markets for the rest of the year. And then we're going to dive down. Uh, the start of 2024 is going to be completely different, but we'll talk about that in a later episode. Yeah, well, I was just going to ask you, what can we expect as far as the rest of the year goes for affordability and real estate in general? So because there's this kind of pressure with rates, unless we get this all of a sudden drop in rates, we got to really get below 7%. And if we get below 7%, then uh, everything I'm about to say goes out the door and you're going to see a re reignition of uh, demand. So with a lot more competition. But as long as these rates remain above 7% and the higher they go, the more that we have to realize that, hey, you know what, the market's going to slow. This is a good period of time anyways towards the end of the year where there have been some people that have been on the market for a little bit longer and there aren't as many buyers that want to want to purchase at this time of the year. Uh, the lion's share of families and also people, they like to place a, place a property in pending status. They want to go after a property during the spring and close during the summer. It's when it makes sense for most everybody. They have extra time off to make it all happen. But now we're, we're gunning for the rest of the year and there's a lot of people that, yeah, they're not really, there's not, the buyer pool shrinks a little bit and that's what we're seeing. We're seeing that shrink and then you see interest rates go up and they're shrinking a little bit more. So that we're seeing that the chances of you getting a little bit more of a deal during this time are actually better. So you're looking for those people that have been on the market for a little bit longer that may have come down in price because I can actually prove it when they've reduced their price, asking price by more than 1%. They actually net less. They should have started out at the exact right price, but now they have to reduce it. They are going to net less even after reducing it their sales to list price ratio goes down. If you come out of the box at the right price and you sell it, your chances of getting really close to asking price are really high. But once you start reducing it, you just have fewer eyeballs on the property because you've been market worn. Uh, you've just been on the market for too long and everybody out there uh, has already seen your property uh, because they, there aren't that many properties on. They get a little uh, alert on their phone and it says, oh, new properties available because they're in the market and they see uh, that, new, that new, new, new property that's available. They're excited about it. One that's been on the market for a while, it just comes in as a price reduction and then they'll flip through all the photos that they've already seen and they'll say, I've seen this property. Even if they haven't seen it, They've seen it on actually been shown it. They've seen it in their palm of their hands. And some people go, yeah, I just don't want to see it. So the number of people that will be excited about that price reduction diminishes compared to initially coming on the market. So I'd take advantage of those people. Now, Zillow economists estimated the U.S. housing market just recently being worth about $52 trillion. Does this affect anything in the market? Uh, no, this just, this just goes to, to show you that what happened is that uh, the United States right now, if you look at all home price indices, that it's actually at an all-time high. 
And so when you get in at, if all values continue to go up, it beat 2022's all time high and it continues to go up a little bit higher. And so right now that the value of where we're at, it is right now at an all time high. So when you aggregate all the United States properties together, if it's an all time high, it's gonna be higher. So that just tells you where we are right now and it has everything to do with this uh, housing uh, catastrophe of not enough homes available. So that, that really has bled into the supply and demand issue of having a catastrophically low uh, number of homes that has has led to because we don't have like extremely incredible demand. We're actually at uh, very, very few cells. And if you look at cumulatively, the number of cells are going to dip below four, four million across the United States. And we haven't seen anything like that since the Great Recession. So the, as far as number of units are concerned, we're doing far, far fewer units. But so you throw demand even though it's smaller, but at this very small number of homeowners that are actively participating. And that's why we've had values continue to go up. But now we're throwing in this monkey wrench of these really high interest rates. And that's where we're going to start to see a change for the next uh, few months of the year. Now, what would you say is the best way to combat this unaffordability, whether when purchasing a home or just in the general economy? Yeah, so as far as to combat this unaffordability is concerned, um, there's a number of things. I, my, my thing is, uh, and I've told this to uh, some m m millennials, if you want to get in the marketplace, there are there's a greater number of people that are actually renting or purchasing out, purchasing little studios and renting like uh, their town home or something like that, or uh, you know buying in some other area that is more affordable and then renting that out, but still renting over here. They're getting into real estate because they need to get their foot in the door, which is a really smart thing to do in all the analytics and trends that we're looking at. So, and another way. Way of doing it is uh, renting out rooms. Um, uh, it'd be great if you can rent it out to a family member. Good thing is, is we have nine kids so that uh, we could start with the oldest. They could do that. They could purchase and then somebody rent and then they can rent out rooms and the next person can purchase and they can rent out rooms and they can, they can continue to do that. And then eventually we're going to get rates that do come down a little bit so they can refinance and get a boost and, and incomes are going to go up so that will be another boost so that uh, you know you don't have to have that roommate. So there are ways of, uh, of, of doing this. But and another thing that that, that buyers can do is uh, just explain to sellers what's going on. And they're going to get go to a listing that has been on the market for a little bit of time that is not getting uh, a offers in this marketplace because things are slowing down enough. And as a result, they can go, look, I'm going to purchase your house, but you've got to pay points and get them to pay points to get that interest rate down lower. So the average points across the United States is 0.8, but if you can throw in a full point, it comes down considerably because now the, the lender can pass off that, that extra money to the servicers so they can sell it off and they will get you a much better interest rate. Because now that you have a much better interest rate, your chance of refinancing diminish as rates start to come down. It takes you longer to refinance. So there's a, there's a, you know, there's a number of different ways to, to look at this. So getting, getting, uh, together with a, a really a excellent mortgage uh, professional is probably the first step. And then dealing with somebody that knows their, what they're doing in this market is a professional uh, real estate agent is also the, uh, another uh, smart step. Now, what would you recommend for first time home buyers or even potential first time home buyers um, in general? Yeah, I think I, I, I pretty much answered that because there's a lot of people that are, that are, uh, ah, this has been frustrating. It's frustrating to be a millennial. There are a lot of millennials that want to purchase, but if you look at the statistics, it's way down the number of millennials that can compete because of how high rates are right now. If you're trying to enter into this marketplace and you've got these rates, I mean, they're the highest in 20 years, or not 20 years, 23 years. It goes all the way back to uh, the year 2000. For many of those, those they, they were, tiny. They might not even entered school yet. Or if they did, you know, they're in the second or third grade. So they don't remember Gladiator from the year 2000. So they're wondering, hey, when am I going to get a break? And I understand that they've had to deal with COVID. They're dealing with these high rates. Their inflation is a lot higher. They go to the pump. These are all issues that, that hit, hit people in their pocketbook. But at the end of the day, you got to look at where are we going in the future. And that's why I've given different examples of going out there, renting out rooms, 
purchasing something in another area, just getting into real estate somehow, getting a duplex. And uh, you, uh, you have one unit and you rent out the other unit. Actually, duplexes aren't twice the cost. It's like 1.6. So, which means that you get a rent, uh, you get your place, but you get a substantial piece of rent to offset that mortgage payment. So there are different ways of doing this. It's just get in because down the road rates will become more favorable and there will be other things that you'll be able to do down the road and incomes will be higher. So it's just get in. So one thing that seems to be a barrier for entry for homeowners is the spread between renting and buying a home right now. And I guess it is 62% more expensive to purchase a home than renting. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, well, if you plug in today's interest rates, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we, we have interest rates that are extremely high. We have not seen interest rates anything close to this. We were stuck uh, below 5 When we got up to 5% in 2019, everybody wigged out, or 2018, rather. In November of 2018, we got it right up to 5%, and everybody was just screaming. Why? Because we... Everybody across the board within uh, real estate, anybody that was purchasing, all everybody out there had were enjoying interest rates in, below five percent, and then they even got below three percent. So uh, they made their way below four. They were in the uh, they were in the uh, threes for a while, and then we saw even during COVID they got below three percent, which is just absolutely insane. So we were used to all these low interest rates, and I hear a lot of people say you should get used to it. It's going to be here for a long time, and. I just, I, I, I don't jive with that. I, I don't see it. I don't see it in the cards down the road. Uh, we're a low interest rate society because of how we're more of a global economy. There's a lot of uh, reasons to look at why uh, interest rates will come down. Uh, and a lot of it has to do with people living a lot longer and us not having enough replacement workers and things like that around the world. So there, there, are, there are a number of reasons that I'm not going to get into the weeds to explain, but uh, interest rates right now, when you look at that number, yeah, you plug in 7.5% and yeah, it's going to look ugly, but that's not where interest rates are going to be down the road. You have to anticipate with that, that eventually that they're going to come down. But as far as knowing when it's going to come down, as everybody learned, we thought interest rates were going to come down across everybody. Every economist thought interest rates were going to ease a little bit sometime uh, by the end of this year. It absolutely didn't happen. And I show what everybody's uh, rate forecasts were back at the end of last year to where, how they've changed recently. And uh, it just says that they all agree that eventually the economy is going to slow and we'll have uh, rates that come down. It's just a matter of when. And so you have to go in this with knowing if you are in it, you have to love your interest interest rate. You have to love the payment. You have to be able to pay that payment for as long as you possibly can because we don't know when rates are going to come down. When they do come down and you can refinance, then you'll get this extra boom in your monthly uh, amount of, uh, of money that you're able to stick into savings and, and uh, up your discretionary spending and all that good stuff. Now, I've stumbled across a couple articles talking about how a company is offering rates as low as 2% using assumable mortgages. Can assumable mortgages help today's market? Yeah, that's more gimmicky than anything else because most, most, uh, uh, most of the uh, loans that are out there are not assumable. So uh, you have to throw that out, A. B, there's this difference that has to be made up, and there's going to be this blend of rate and stuff that has to go on. So, And there's not that many people that know how to do it. There are a few people that are out there that, that understand what it is, and they're going to pay you. Uh, you're going to have to pay them to put it together so that you can get this blended rate. So there's extra costs that's involved in all that stuff. So it's really more, it's going to be more fad than any, anything else. You're not going to see a lot of people come out and assume it. Because you have to understand that most everybody, they've watched their, in, their, their net equities just rise like crazy. Well, there's this big differential from where they're, what they have on, as a loan as to what they're going to be purchasing at. There's this big differential. They have to make up that difference. And they can get it with some sort of a blended rate and more cost and things like that. And it's just going to be, uh, it's, there's not going to be that many people that are going to exercise that. So... It, I hear a lot, a lot. It, it's a lot of noise that's out there, but as far as how many people are going to be able to do it, it's it's few and far between. Well, I just wanted to hear what you thought of this, but one of the funniest headlines that caught my eye this week was, um, "quote 
Uh, it said, housing market crash alert. Fannie Mae just sounded the alarm. Fannie Mae warned that the U.S. is headed for a slowdown in home sales. So I was just wondering what you thought of that article. Slowdown in home sales. They're late to the party. It already happened. That giant drop that they're talking about, that crash, already happened. That happened in 2022 at the end. We saw this nosedive. So the nosedive occurred, and that was a, you know, it's already occurred. As far as, I'm telling you guys that demand's coming down, but it's, if you look at demand curves across the board, everywhere I'm looking at, it's not like it's diving down. It is pretty flat maybe coming down a little bit since spring. Nothing gigantic. We've had some markets where it's come down a little bit, but then it, it likes to go uh, at this uh, at a pretty flat level. The reason for that is there will always be buyers in the marketplace. Always. There are cash buyers that are out there. There are investors that are out there. There are people that want to be near their kids that are out there. There are people that have had too many babies like my family and you need a bigger house that they just can't wait any longer and they're pulling the trigger. So there will always be buyers just as there will always be sellers. The buying public that we have right now is what I almost refer to as inherent demand. There's a actual, can't even remember what the name of it is, but people need shelter period. And either they rent it or they purchase it. And some people just don't want to rent and they're going to purchase. So that's what we're dealing with. So we're not going to see this giant drop in, in demand. So we're not going to see this giant drop in supply. Yes, we're going to go below 4 million for the, uh, towards the end of the year. But like I said, as rates start to come down, down the road, we will get a hotter market down the road where there will be more buyers and there also will be more sellers. But we have to come down quite a bit in rates to encourage a lot of these people that have have these rates that are much lower to even come on the market to make for, for it to make sense for their families. Now, I know we talked, I think it was last episode about politics, not directly affecting real estate, but can a government shutdown impact the housing market at all? Huh, well, we just saw it. We just saw it in the dumbed interest rates today. <laughs> People are going to get a little bit of a, a cushion. Maybe they locked in earlier before that vote happened uh, in the House. But that's that's the issue. I mean, the, it, it affects us in rates because the longer we go on, there are things that can happen that uh, we can get different credit ratings, which then people can say, I don't want to uh, purchase any of these uh, treasuries. Uh, I don't want uh, to get involved in the bond market while this is going on until the United States gets their act together. You're gonna hear some of that. And you're gonna hear a lot of that noise. That will bleed into the bond market, which bleeds into interest rates, which is what drives our marketplace are these interest rates. So. The longer this goes on, the dumber it is. I, 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 I who was it that I heard that said it? I, I cannot recall. But um, he basically <laughs> he said, and, and I think this goes back to somebody else that said it a long time ago. But uh, if, if you can't, if you can't uh, come to an agreement and the government shuts down, everybody in Congress should not be be allowed to be reelected. They should all figure it out and and shake on this thing, figure it out, go to the war room, and this is all they should be focusing on. And uh, then if they don't, and we have this shutdown of the government, then there should be some clause that allow that where they all uh, are need to be, uh, they won't be able to be reelected. We'll have a new slate of people to govern our country. Of course, we could never get that passed. <laughs> yeah. Well, now I just like to transition over to a common theme that we've been hearing, and it's about homeowner, uh, homeowners insurance. So someone mentioned to you how the homeowners insurance situation is a nightmare and was a challenge for closing an escrow this last week. So can you explain what is going on? Yeah, it's been an absolute night nightmare. So what happened was... There are a, bun a bunch of insurance companies that are losing a lot of money because of all the different disasters. In California, it's been wildfires. We have had a lot of wildfires. In Florida, it's hurricanes. And there's other uh, states as well. I'm just giving you two giant examples. So in California, it's wildfires. And as a result, the way that you get new rates for the state of California are these insurance companies have to file new rates. And they file these new rates 
and it takes the uh, Department of Insurance so long to answer, it's like a year and a half of them to answer, and after a year and a half, they could say, sorry, no. And uh, they, that they're losing so much money in California that we had all the big, a uh, whole bunch of big players leave the state of California and say, we are not coming back until our rates are approved. And so they've left. And uh, then we have the, the uh, you know, in Sacramento, they, there is a body, uh, the, gover the government that's there, and they failed to come up with a solution. So which left it to uh, this Department of Insurance head, as well as the governor, to come up with a solution. And they have come up with a solution. It's not going to happen immediately, but they're getting agreement with these insurance companies that have left that they uh, are going to come back. Now, this is all, it's all in the preliminary works. But right now, there aren't that many options, and there's a California option, and it's made it so expensive that uh, some people are paying through the nose because there's just not that many that are uh, available. So that's what we mean by they're killing deals where you're trying to get insurance and you can't get insurance on a house where it's like some astronomical amount where it just absolutely doesn't make sense. And we have people that are saying, yeah, can't get insurance on this house. So that's what we were dealing with where it was it was slowing down the progress of, of transactions because then they finally get something. There was a delay in putting it together. They have to go to the California fund. It's not instantaneous and they finally get it and they close. So that's what we're hearing more of. But there will be options down the road. Will insurance be more expensive? Yes. We've already dealt with inflation of everything else. The uh, cost to these insurance uh, companies has been astronomical for these areas that have been uh, prone to natural d disasters and they're in it for a profit. So if they're, it's not going to be profitable, they're not here to do it for the common good. They're doing it for profit. So they have to, they have to get some sort of a profit going in these states. And that's why they've opted to leave the state. And, but there is a solution in the works. Awesome. Well, that's good to hear. Well, we're going to have to conclude today's episode. So thank you again for everyone tuning into another episode of Let's Talk Housing. Now, if you want to learn more about what is going on in the real estate industry across Southern California or the Bay Area, feel free to check out our YouTube or subscribe today at reportsonhousing.com. Please, please leave us a good review. And if you have any questions at all, feel free to post it to our social media or you can even email me at info at reportsonhousing.com. We will see you soon and have a fantastic rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thank you.